It's not a conscious thing. I do the things that I gravitate towards. Mostly it's like, you know, I really get inspired by true stories, but if it's something that I, I would want to see myself or I think audiences want to see me in, but I don't limit it to that. I kind of, you know, want to try different things. The great thing is I have a lot of real life experience and I get to draw on those things and I think that's invaluable when playing these parts because people and audiences can really detect authenticity. So yeah, I mean, I'm just doing what I'm feeling is like the thing to do at the time. I'm Mark Wahlberg and this is the timeline of my career. Laertes, Haywood. Laertes is a fool. He ain't never stopped to think about what type of person Hamlet was. All he does is do what the king tells him to do. When he fights Hamlet, all they do is end up killing each other. That's his problem. He don't stop and think before he acts. I want somebody else, Bill. Renaissance man, I could talk about all day. It's the reason why I'm here today. Penny is the reason why I'm here today. I have so much appreciation and gratitude and love for her, I miss her dearly. I had started out in music. Um, I was being offered a couple of roles um, because of my success in music and my stint in underwear modeling. I had gotten offered uh, Sister Act 2 to be a rapper. Um, I got offered a bad guy in a rollerblade movie that uh, I was like, no, I can't do this, don't want to do it. Don't want to do movies at all. I thought I was going to be Eminem and have a crazy hip hop career. And then I got a call saying, uh, would you like to meet Penny Marshall? And I said, you mean Laverne? And he, they were like, yes. And I said, oh, yes, I actually, I was in New York at the time. So I said, I'll go to that meeting. They said, oh, Danny DeVito's going to be there, too. I said, oh, my God, this is great. People that I grew up watching. I went into the meeting, and I was just so excited to meet her and Danny. And then we started talking about life and where I came from and, you know, me being from Boston and uh, her being from the Bronx. Uh, we just hit it off. And then she goes, so how come you don't want to be in movies? I said, no, I'm not an actor. She goes, oh, you are an actor. You're acting right now. And she goes, take these pages, go outside, and come back, and let's read a scene. So I literally auditioned, I don't know, probably three or four roles that day. It was just a lot of fun, and it was just very different from anybody else that I had met in music. Uh, they were interested in me, the person, and thought that maybe that I could, you know, possibly bring something to the equation. So we uh, then planned on, if I made it to the next level, flying myself out to LA to go on a screen test. I remember getting the call. I was in New Jersey at my then manager's house, and she called me and told me that I'd gotten the part. And uh, flew back out to LA, rehearsed with her, went to South Carolina, shot, and then we're in LA. And I literally spent every single day on the set. I wanted to know what everybody was doing and why, both in front of and behind the camera. So I really kind of went to school on it. It was like Penny Marshall School of Acting. She would do the, the craziest things. Like when I was shooting like a close up, she would be doing the off camera instead of the other actor. But instead of playing the other actor's role, she would basically be doing what she wanted me to be doing at the time. She'd be like, Marky, like this. And I was like, what? I was very <laughs> confused. But uh, after that, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. And uh, you know, um, we lost Penny um, last year, and it was very, very sad. And I remember her sister calling me, and I was like, Hey, what's going on? She was like, You got to come get your stuff. I'm like, What stuff? And she's like. Penny left you all this sports memorabilia, all this Patriot stuff and Red Sox stuff and golf stuff because she knew how much you loved them. I would definitely, definitely not be here if it weren't for Penny. Go ahead, take another sip so I can blow your fucking head all over the counter. Go ahead, Pedro, go ahead! That movie was directed by Scott Calvert, who um, directed all of my early music videos. When we made the video for Good Vibrations, he goes, you're going to be an actor. And I said, no, I'm not. He goes, you are, and I said, I've only told that to two other people. He told that to Will Smith and to Tupac when he directed them in their music videos. Um, and then uh, Basketball Diaries was happening. Uh, A.B. Kaufman was the casting director. I went for my first audition, went for my second audition, went for my third audition. It, the audition became like uh, a thing where people would come and watch. I remember Chris Blackwell, who was the owner of uh, Island Records and Island Films, he discovered Bob Marley. He, uh, he came to watch the audition. I mean, people were just coming to watch, and I was unfortunately being a little too aggressive with the other actors, but that was kind of how I had done my thing at the time. I remember one actor, I don't want to say his name, but he was like, man, if I don't get this part, I'm going to be so pissed. He keep kicking my ass, and I'm like, I 
I hope you get the part. I don't know if I'm going to get the part. I auditioned for seven times and then realized that um, certain people were like, no, Mark can't be in this movie. And I was like, well, I don't know about certain people either. But then finally, they were able to kind of get everybody in a room. I ended up, it was an accident. I showed up probably about six hours late. We were uh, supposed to audition. I think it was on a Monday. It was a Thursday. So we're like, yeah, what are we going to do all weekend? I was like, oh, let's go to Puerto Rico. I've never been to Puerto Rico. So we flew to Puerto Rico. And then there was a snowstorm, so we got stuck in Puerto Rico, missed the flight, showed up at like 10 o'clock at night. I walked in, everybody was not happy, but I was like, let's do this shit. And we started reading, and then I looked at Leo, I was like, damn, this dude's pretty good. I had only played basketball with him once, so we really, you know, that was the only kind of interaction that we had, and that was not pleasant for either one of us, so. Uh, and then he looked at me, and it was like, I don't know, an hour later, we were out at the club, tearing it up, and we hit it off after that. The cops are coming, come on! That's what this whole thing's about, Steve. Your inadequacies, your fears. You just wait a minute. Well, listen to me. See, I'm hip to your problems. All of them. I know you abandoned Nicole when she needed you most. Because I licked her sweet tears. I know about things coming apart at work. Maybe you fucking lost it in that department. I also know you ain't keeping up, so to speak, your end of the bargain with the missus. And then going into Fear, which Leo actually was kind enough to recommend me to Jimmy Foley. And Jimmy Foley was like, who's Mark Wahlberg? He was like, you know the guy Marky Mark? He was like, what? Are you out of your mind? He's like, I'm not putting Marky Mark in this movie. He was like, dude, I'm telling you, just see him. So I met with Foley. We hit it off. We hung out for eight hours at a bar in New York. By the time I got home, he called me. He goes, you know, I can't give you this part, right? I was like, I don't know. It's all good. You do whatever you want. It's your movie. And then he goes, well, I'd like to audition you for one of the guys in the gang. And it was like, but the part, the parts were so small, they didn't have any lines. He was like, just read the lead, and then I'll uh, see if I can give you one of the other parts. And then I did the audition, and he was like, I'm gonna tell the studio if they don't hire you to be the lead in this movie, then I'm not doing the movie. I said, okay, you don't have to do that. I goes, but if you feel that strongly about it, because they hadn't seen Renaissance Man or Basketball Diaries, and he fought for me to be the lead in that movie. When I close my eyes, I see this thing. It's like this big sign, and the name is in like bright blue neon lights with like purple outline. And this name is just so bright and so sharp that the sign, it just blows up because the name is just so powerful. Boogie Nights was one of those things where the script came my way. I was really kind of turned off by the subject matter. I was like not interested in doing a movie about pornography and I was really just trying to build my career one role at a time. I felt like, you know, anytime there was an opportunity to do something that seemed to be sexual or exploiting me physically, it was like, I don't know. So I read 30 pages of the script and I put it down. I was like, this could be fantastic or this could be terrible. I mean, Showgirls had just come out and we really didn't know what to make of it. And then I met with PTA and I was like, oh God, I, this, this could be great. He was supposed to be offering me the part, but he said he just wanted to do one more meeting where John C. Riley and Philip Seymour Hoffman and uh, Thomas Jane were also there, which turned into a bit of an impromptu audition. We kind of read and did that whole thing, and then I committed to making that movie. And, you know, it was one of the great experiences of my career. You know, we both, like, Paul and I were both 25 at the time, and we just kind of left to, to our own devices and doing our own thing. It was a really cool experience. Hey, freeze! No, he's with us! Don't shoot him, he's with us! You're the guy with the little girl, right? That's right. What are you doing here, man? He helped us find you. I came here to help you. All right. You're all right, man. Three Kings, I had gotten a call. John Lesher, who represented uh, PTA, David and Russell, and also James Gray. So I had already done Boogie Nights. I was shooting The Yards at the time. So I was very much in character for The Yards, and I met with David and Russell. I'm just sitting there kind of talking as the character and like talking about Jimmy Kahn and New York and all this stuff and getting out of jail, and he was like, well, that's cool, but do you want to do this movie? And he was also trying to audition Spike Jones, who was a filmmaker, but he wasn't known as an actor. So he was kind of like trying to do two things at once, cast me in the movie and also cast Spike. So we finally started reading and playing around, and, and uh, we really hit it off. And then, of course, uh, trying to cast the other roles was quite a bit of a challenge. It was a lot of different people uh, before it became Clooney and, and Ice Cube. Fun time. How's your little girl? She's safe from now. Do you know where these come from? Yeah, my closet. The Indonesia. Store. In baby, this is the truth, okay? Little girls like you, they have to work in dark factories where they go blind for a dollar sixty a month just to make mommy her pretty shoes. Can you even imagine that, Caitlin? I don't want the children to work in factories. Don't 
After Three Kings, David wanted to do Huckabees, and I read the script, and then he started sending me all these things, the jewel tree, and then started talking about petroleum, the environment, all this stuff. And I was like, all right, I, can, I guess I can dig that. I really just believed in him, and I was gonna kind of go along for the ride and commit to servicing his vision. And then once I got into it, I really got into it. A lot of fun. I remember Dustin Hoffman looking at me like, is this kid doing? And I was just like, whatever, I'm doing my thing, bro. And then all of a sudden, cut to like six months later, he was kind enough to kind of give me some award at some event. And he go, he told the story, he goes, oh, God, I kept looking at this kid like he didn't know what the f he was doing. And he said he was the only one that was good in the movie. And he said, uh, I was just committed on a different level. But um, it was one of those things where, you know, David would love to kind of push me and challenge me. And I was completely embracing that. I loved the idea of uh, being challenged and pushed and going for stuff, you know, it was like it was one of those things where you just kind of felt uh, very liberating and free to try and explore and risk looking ridiculous. Mommy doesn't ask because mommy doesn't care. You have different accents? You did, didn't you, you little fucking snake? You were like different people. You a psychiatrist? Well, if I was, I'd ask you why you were a steady making 30 grand a year, and I'd think if I was Sigmund fucking Freud, I wouldn't get an answer. So tell me, what's a lace curtain motherfucker like you doing in the Stadies? The Parted was uh, another thing. I was uh, shooting Four Brothers at the time. Originally was gonna be cast in another role in The Departed. The studio was pushing back. I wasn't gonna do the movie. And then my agent, who also worked with Marty, told them that I would play the other role. And then Marty called me and said he was really excited that I was playing the role. And I said, I'm not playing the role. And he was like, what? And I was like, I'm not playing that role. My agent calls me and goes, what the f are you doing? Just go to New York and talk to him because he wants to talk to you about it. And you know, he really thinks that this is the, the, the role in the film. And so I said, all right, well, if you fly me to New York, because I'd rather be in New York for a weekend, I've been shooting in Canada. And then uh, I went and met with Marty and I read the script on the way and then I thought about it and I was like, if I play this role, I'm gonna get to go at everybody in a way where they're probably not gonna like it, but it is what it is. Um, and so I said, yeah, I said, if you let me do my thing, say what I want, do what I want, then I'll do it. I said, but you gotta get me in and out quick because I'm shooting another movie. Me and Marty made up and it was all love after that. I'm the best friend you have on the face of this earth and I'm gonna help you understand something, you punk. You don't think I'm a real cop, do you? No, I don't. I've said that directly to your face numerous times. I was really honest about that. Work on a huge case, all right? Property owner. With seven buildings under construction, he hasn't applied for a single scaffolding permit. Now, according to Ask Jeeves, this perp is at the Plaza Hotel speaking right now. That's your big case? Scaffolding permits? Yeah. Guess what? You're coming with me. <laughs> it's a wooden gun. Oh! It hurts, man. So we always wanted to do comedy and there were comedic elements to the performances that I had done in the past, but we'd never done a full-blown comedy. I had met a lot of comedians and I was like, oh, life's too short, you know, not what they appear to be on screen, you know? I don't want to do that. I don't want to like be like, hey, 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 and then all of a sudden all weird and nobody's talking in between takes and shit. I did a, a little part in Date Night with uh, Tina Fey and uh, Steve Carell, which was fun. But when I met with Will Farrell and Adam McKay, walked in, sat down with them for five minutes, and I was like, I'll do this. And they're like, well, we haven't even told you what it is yet. I was like, I don't give a shit, I'm in. They're like, okay. And then they told me the idea and I said, I'm in. Three months later, we had the script and then we were shooting. And then they just kept encouraging me to just do my thing and go crazy. They were like, there's no rules. I was like, dude, you're gonna want rules. If I go crazy, you're gonna want rules. I'm like, no, there's no rules. And a couple times when I was choking Will or something, he was like, well, there's a couple rules. But, <laughs> but, um, but I had so much fun on that movie, and it was like, we would shoot everything that was on the page, like the first half of the day, and then the rest of the day we would just improvise. Because I get a little out of hand, you know? I get a little crazy. But they never told me to chill out. I mean, Adam McKay was just giving us gems and trying stuff, and it was one of the great experiences that I've ever had. I've always got Little River Band loaded up here. I got six discs in here. I made a promise to them I wouldn't work with you again. Huh? I had to. After everything that happened, I'm sorry. You sticking to that? Glad you're back. 
Oh, good. Well, there were many different versions of that movie. Darren Aronofsky was attached to direct the movie, as were a couple of other filmmakers. It was going to be either me and Matt Damon or Brad Pitt were both attached at the time. It was at Paramount. It was a big studio movie with a big budget. Once those guys fell out and the director fell out, the movie was going to kind of be put into turnaround, and I was committed to making the movie. I had made a promise to Mickey and Dickie and to the people of Lowell that, that I was going to make the movie, and then we're going to remind people that Lowell is a great industrial town and not a town infested with crack and drugs and negativity. And so uh, we kept trying to fight to get the movie made, H hire another filmmaker, approach Christian Bale at uh, our kids' elementary school, I think it was preschool at the time, started telling him about the movie saw what he had done in uh, a few other movies. And, uh, and so I talked to him about it, and he really liked the idea, got him the script. And then uh, we were talking to a couple of other filmmakers, and David kept throwing his hat in the ring. He would call me every day, and we would talk about it. One day, I, 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 I said to myself, I got to make this happen. I got to make this happen with David. And so I wrote down a long list of notes, and the person who was running the studio at the time was David's former agent. And I, spilled my guts out and pleaded my case for two hours. And he looks at me, he goes, I thought you wanted to do this romantic comedy with Cameron Diaz. I said, dude, no, I want you to give me the fighter, allow us to hire David O. Russell, we'll make it for next to no money, and we'll bring it back to you guys. And if you want to distribute the film, you can. If not, we'll figure it out. But trust in me, put the faith in me to be able to get the movie done and make sure that it's done the right way. I was able to uh, get that movie made and uh, fulfill my promise to Mickey and Dickie and to, uh, to Alice and the family. I don't know what else to say. Well, we should fucking double date or something. You, me, and Laurie, and uh, what's her name? White trash name, guess. Mandy. Nope. Marilyn. Nope. Brittany. Nope. Tiffany. Nope. Candace. Nope. Don't fuck with me on this. I'm I know not, this shit. Do you see me fucking with you? I'm not, All right, I'm speed round. I'm going to rattle off some names, and when I hit you it, fucking it. buzz it, okay? I will tell you. You got me? Yeah. All right, Brandy, Heather, Channing, Brianna, Amber, Sabrina, Melody, Dakota, Sierra, Bambi, Crystal. Going Samantha, into Ted, it was one of those things where, again, I was like, I don't know, seems like a great idea, but it's also a crazy idea. You, know, you can't pitch a guy in a teddy bear who comes to life and, you know, all of a sudden they're just smoking weed and <laughs> saying stupid shit. It's not a good pitch, right? So she was right after the fighter. Uh, I was kind of, you know, doing more serious stuff. I was like, I don't know. But then I met with Seth, read the script, and it was just like one of the great buddy comedies of all time. And I saw the technology, and I said, oh, this could work. Just got to be committed to it. And then, of course, we made the movie. It's the biggest R-rated comedy of all time. Lauren, Charlene, Chantel, Courtney, Misty, Jenny, Kristen. Wait, wait. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go, sir. We gotta go now. Let's move. Pete and I, it's funny because we also shared the same agent, and he had been trying to get us together for a long time. I knew Pete from like Gold's Gym in Hollywood, and like I brought him to my house, tried to convince him to direct the fighter. He passed. I think he regretted it a little bit after, but he passed. Uh, and then Lone Survivor came. I had actually helped secure the financing for the movie. Uh, he was having a hard time getting it made. Universal wasn't committing to making the movie, so I had uh, got a guy who had financed Two Guns and uh, also Broken City with me and Russell Crowe. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we can make this movie after. This is the fourth movie I did in a row with no more than two weeks break in between all four movies. From Broken City, Pain and Gain, Two Guns, and Lone Survivor. We had an amazing time. We created this bond and this brotherhood, and now, you know, we're five movies in, and we did Deepwater Horizon. Make sure this man gets off this ring, okay? Everybody calm down. Slow it down. Smooth it out, all right? Okay, okay. okay. let's go. We brought Pete in to make that movie, and then we went right into, we were working on Patriot's Day as we were shooting Deepwater Horizon. So foot, I said, this boy from, Oh, I think from Marathon Sport, he looked like uh, like a little BU kid, like a uh, like a good kid, Carol. You know, he, he had a um, assistant manager tag, and and um, he helped. I, we we moved her. We we laid it down. Patriots Day was one of those things where I wasn't really too keen on making. I thought, you know, uh, too close to home, too sensitive a subject, but I realized that if, if it wasn't us, somebody else was going to make the movie. And if somebody else came in and didn't handle it with the sensitivity and respect that it deserved, um, could have easily focused on the violence of it all and made it gratuitous. And, you know, um, so we wanted to be able to protect 
the story and the people and the way it was told. And, and what happened and the way the city reacted made me really proud to be a Bostonian. Before that, the only thing I really had to be proud of from being from Boston was sports accomplishments with my teams. Um, Boston had a bad rap and so um, wanted to tell that story. And uh, not an easy thing to do with dealing with loss because it's one thing to deal with Navy SEALs who want to get into a gunfight every day. They wake up in the morning like, oh, let's get into a gunfight today. Or working on a movie about oil rig workers who know the dangers and the risks of working on an oil rig. It's one of the most dangerous occupations there is. There's a difference between those two films and somebody who's going on to cheer on a loved one in a road race at the first day of spring and some cowards take a bomb and place it behind innocent women and children as they're standing there rooting on their loved ones in a road race. And that was a heavy, that was a heavy thing to deal with, certainly with me um, being in Boston and from Boston. So we decided after that we just wanted to kind of do something a little bit more light and fun. And so then we did Mile 22 and that's what got us to uh, Spencer. And then there was an eight-year-old boy. Wonderland is basically like an abandoned fortress, all right? And there's pretty much only one way in right here. It's the middle of the day. There's not a lot of places to hide. We're going to have to get Henry out of the way. But I got a plan. It's a little unconventional. You're going to have to trust me. No, 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 no. No, you don't get the cool gun. Uh, Hawk is the name of a motherfucker with a shotgun. Spencer does your taxes. That was good. I'll give you that one. Ours is based on the book. There's 48 books in the series. But there was also a TV show which gave me a bird's eye view of neighborhoods uh, that I was familiar with on television. And that and the Brinks job were the only time we had seen Boston in movies or on television uh, other than the news. So uh, it was really cool and I loved the idea of playing that character. Um, There's a guy who was, who was a Boston police officer, believed in the law, doing the right thing, and then kept witnessing all these terrible uh, acts of corruption and, you know, uh, a homicide being kind of swept under the rug. And so he decides to take the law into his own hands and ends up beating the crap out of his superior officer, ends up going to prison, survives in general population uh, for five years and then gets out and he's going to leave town and of course he just can't walk away or turn his back on somebody being wronged or innocent people. And so he uh, sticks his nose back into places where it doesn't belong. It's funny, it's emotional, there are real stakes there and it was nice to be back at home. You talk, for me personally, talk about coming full circle, having been in trouble, been incarcerated, turning my life around, really working hard to, uh, to put myself on the right path. And then to be sitting there on Peveril Street, shooting at 24 Peveril Street, that's Alan Arkin's character's home. And I grew up on 25 Peveril Street, sitting on my stoop while they were setting up the shots. And uh, having turned my life around now, creating jobs and inspiring kids in my community, inner city kids and at-risk youth, that it doesn't matter where you come from, where you start, aspire to achieve great things. If you do the work, anything is possible. I'm Mark Wahlberg, and this has been the timeline of my career. And just by the way, I've worked with people who would not be able to remember that line alone, never mind learning their lines on a movie that they're getting well compensated for. They would need a cue card and an earwig. And I will name names when I retire.